So hopefully the recording works. Uh, today what I'm going to be talking is about um, a different hardware programming language that we are building in our research group. So a little background. So my name is Jose Renau. I'm a professor at Computer Science and Engineering since 2004. Uh, my area of research is quite similar to what's called, in a way, is computer architecture, but slightly different focus. I've been focusing more, traditionally, it's more how to design out of order CPUs, high performance CPUs. And lately, it's been more like how to improve the productivity. So, what I've been going to be talking is done by a large people or contributing on the project. Um, and I'm going to be focusing on the Pyro. That is a new hardware description language we've been working. So a little bit before we start, PyroPorage. Why do we start a new language? So in 2006, I have a project that was to build an auto for the CPU. And there were several students collaborating on that. So on that target, you need high performance. You are concerned with the area, frequency. Um, and what we quickly found out is that the problems was not only our understanding of the design, but mostly the problem was with the tools. And there were two problems in the tools. One is the tools were very slow to compile, and the other one is that the language, very lucky, was very painful to use. So in around 2008, we stopped working on this out-of-order core, and where we say, okay, let's focus instead on the infrastructure to build out-of-order core, and maybe later we come. And there were some effort that did some verification, there is some effort on the compiler, and there was an effort on the language. So what I'm going to be talking is about the language part. But there were these three different things, how to improve the productivity of chip design. So, the, so why is it called Pyrop? And that gives you a little history. It's an old research group. We tend to use Ruby as a scripting language. And the first version of the language kind of sim had similarities with uh, Ruby. And what's a Pyrop? A Pyrop is a stone that is as similar to a Ruby, but it's not. Um, we never release it outside our research group. The first PhD student who was working on Pyrop, uh, Blake, he graduated after trying many different things, trying to evolve the language. Um, but in nearly all the cases, and we are going to see a little some of the changes, how it went through time. In nearly all the cases, there was a new language, not a DSL. Like Chisel is a DSL. It's built on top of another language. In our case, we say, no, let's simplify the syntax. Let's build a parser, compiler, infrastructure, and everything. Because after all, there were the three things we were doing. One is the verification. The one the incremental file compiler, very fast feedback and then the other one, the, the language. So there is no point of doing a DSL because there were some other students working on the compiler. Uh, zero cost abstraction, it means that if you, another way to say that is we care about building an out of order CPU, which is the maximum possible frequency you can do. So it means that if you want to put the detail you should be able to see where is the cycle, where is the timing go, and not lose overhead. Now, you can always create some abstractions that they are not so high performance. But the idea is that if you want to go low level, you can understand very close to low level. And this is a concept that they use in C++. They call it a zero abstraction language, because you can do virtual functions if you want, or higher level constructs. But if you want, you can go down and know what's going on. From the beginning, we were trying to do an integration with fluid pipelines. And that's shown in many places across the language. What is this? It's a handshake. It's an elasticity. So for a CPU, not so much. But when you are designing blocks, many times you're going to have a valid and a retry or token credit, some handshake between blocks. So we wanted to build this into the language. Because of the Ruby, we have been always like a prototype of tag typing inheritance, in not like a typical object-oriented. 
on a global type inference. So that's something we've been always focusing on. It has put a lot of effort on the compiler and changes. So the old pirate is dead, long life the pirate. <laughs> <laughs> so what do I mean by this? Is that we had many different versions of pirate and the language syntax has been changing a lot. And, and this is, for example, one of the old, very old versions. It doesn't look like that in the newer versions, but just to showcase like this. This is a typical GCD example. So what is, and then later I'm gonna come to, to see what is the philosophy, what is the, we've been learning through the years. At the beginning, we didn't have it so clear. So at the beginning, we were sort of separating the reset blocks with the rest of the blocks. Uh, we were trying to do a little support for the for registers. Whenever it was an add, it was a register. So it was automatically inferred. So when you were designing a block like this, the idea is that it was automatically inferred. In, we, the size or the value was inferred based on in the input size. So you don't have to specify the size of X and Y. That was even from the beginning. And we were doing all the type, type check on sizes, but when you were doing a comma at the beginning means you can drop bits and the result of the addition, don't do a check on the size, so I will not infer the size of this X. It has to be inferred somewhere else. But otherwise, there's always a, a check and a result. So the syntax might be different, but you are starting to get something. So we had some extra syntax to map better to hardware. We were separating the reset, and we started to play with bit with inference and checks. Now, the, this first version didn't have the elastic handshake, or oh, it had a little bit of strange syntax. And what we did is, that now we, in hindsight, it was the next version, we put too much of the extreme syntax. So let me show you another example. So this is version 0.2. So after skipping several, it kept evolving. And this is to implement a ring. Now, what is the problem? This is not what we have. But so you see the evolution, how we've been going. So, so this is defining a function, in a way. So define a module that is a router. And that was to specify that it's a beginner function. Uh, whenever you were saying a dollar, it was an input. Whenever you were saying a percentage, it was an output. If we were saying an add, it was a register. We started to annotate a lot of things there. Now, why is the reason for this, and why we later dropped it? Um, one of the reasons is that you program in Verilog. The language is, it has its flaws but it has the advantage that it, every tool uses it. Now, the way that most people survive with that language is that they have a very strong coding style or guidelines. So for example, whenever you do an output, you do underscore ow, or when you have a raise underscore rec, or underscore next for the variables that you're gonna plop on the next cycle. And the coding style might be slightly different, but you encode part of the functionality on the variable name. So our thinking was, well, let's put it outside the variable name because underscore next is sort of restricted. Let's put it this way, and we're using the dollars, percentages, and ads. And then the compiler can check it too because the compiler can do a check. It's not if it's a code install guideline that you break or not. Now, the, we were using this for a very long time, but we sort of dropped it because it when you show the language to a new person, it gets it very complicated. It's like, what is all the symbols? What is this? It looks ugly. And um, I think we can avoid it. And that's why we're doing the latest versions without having to enforce such a strict coding style. Uh, you have a program in C++ and Rust. You don't have such a strong coding style. And, and that was a little bit of the thing that the language has been evolving and we've been trying to be more careful is that there are a lot of strange things that many HDLs have because they come from a hardware background and they don't really need them. 
So, so one of the new rules that we have is how will be a non-hardware programmer expect this to behave? And when I'm, and whenever possible, we use to, we follow that. It's like if you were a good Java or C++ programmer, a decent programmer, but you have never seen hardware, you don't know what's an AND gate or flop or anything like that. What would you expect this program to do? And we always try to go towards what the programmer will expect to do, not to do strange things. So we drop quite a few things. Uh, this thing is something that we changed the syntax, but we are kept. We were used to have two underscores is to mark attributes. So sometimes so you have variables and you want to say, like for example, in a register, you want to say it's going to work in the poset or in the get. Uh, you want to, uh, in this case, it's that there was fluid handshake on those variables. Uh, you want to say this should be known at compile time. So you add attributes to the things, and we are going to see the little syntax. But this is the older syntax. So how does it look, the latest one? Um, so it's a little bit more like what you would expect in some modern programming language. So you just declare a variable. You have procedure, procedures of functions. What's the difference for us? A function is pure combinational. Procedure can have flops. Uh, so then you have your list of inputs and outputs. In this case, the flop are going to be output because the register flop yeah, because there is a reg. Otherwise, it will be more likely combinational. Now, when you declare a reg, means that it's a flop, like what you would expect, but not like what is in Verilog, that it depends how you instantiate or not. And there are some constructs like this that they help you for pipelining. So you are designing hardware. What is the thing that is the hardest? Mostly it's pipelining. Memories also get complicated for poor sharing, but pipeline is the thing that it gets the hardest, like time dependence across centers or things like that. So we are trying to add constructs to help us there. Uh, so what does this thing mean? Is, well, this builds a state machine that every loop iteration, so there's a loop iteration, will execute this. So whenever you have the, 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 the function starts, then you do every loop iteration. And this bottom part is just to build a test. So you do 4.4, four, and then you do the test. Now, why you, you could have put the test before and then 4.4, four, but then the advantage is that this, in fact, has 10,000 independent tests. Uh, and then you do that, you compute the test. Now, what do I do this? This is another trying to help. So this, this is a procedure. And this is something that we are doing, but that we are not very happy. So maybe change it. So what is the thing that we have? So this thing has flops. Now, if you were thinking as a normal programmer, I see a function call, I have the outputs, the inputs, I'll have the output compute based on this. But here is, well, the output of C is not necessarily the output that I have this cycle. It's something is being, maybe, in this case, the variable number of cycles. So what is the thing that we do? We are force the programmer explicitly to say, be aware that there is a, when you put equal bound, it means there is a time dependence, like a, like a future that you were programming in a normal programming language. And in between, you put a range to the allow value. Well, this is open range. That means that it can go from zero to n number of cycles. Um, but there is a valid for the signals. So whenever it happens, then you will see the valid. And then you can check the results. This is just calling a C++ version of the code. So there is some support for pipelining. There is global inference. Like for example, we don't specify the size of it. It will be bound later what's the size and actually means. We don't say four bits or eight bits. 
for the size of the size, the size of the insulin, you will destroy the size. Um, there is a valid signal that it propagates with a deep cell variable. If you don't use it, it gets simplified away, but if you use it, you have it there. Yes. So in this example, this weight for Z is waiting for a valid signal. Yes. How is this, how is the valid signal driven in this example? Um, when you finish the loop, when you finish the function, it's a valid signal. Okay. That's just inferred by the. When you finish the function, it will assume that there is no while. So then whenever you finish the function, it will be. Okay. Yeah. Now because there is a, the outputs are red, it will still be delayed one cycle. So then uh, when we just declare a process that will only have one valid signal. So yes. And the inputs don't have their own valid, each one of them, but the output is only one valid signal. And this is a lot of another example, but no need to go over it. Is that you can have uh, the question mark to check for the valid, and you can instantiate blocks in different way. So there is the syntax is really nicer, like for iterators, things like that. Now, what is the key difference with other HDLs? And I'm, we're going to go over the documentation and to see some of the things. So we try to be modern looking like what you would expect in a language like Rust or Swift. Both of them are different languages, but they have very similar kind of syntax to declare function returns and things like that. We do structural typing. This is coming from the beginning, from the, the thing we're doing with Spiral. Uh, that is a Ruby-like. Structural typing, another way to say is, is the closer to that typing inference, but it's not dynamically type checked, it's compile time check. Uh, we try to put pipelining support on the language to help you when it's possible, and this is something evolving. We did a lot of effort to have Elastic, and we want to keep some things, but I think we overdid it. In the past, we require everything to be elastic. Well, here we are trying to see if um, only you specifically put the type of elastic. So for the moment, we want to put the support on the future, it's still not there. And as I mentioned before, we always think, what will be a non-hardware programmer expect? And then follow that syntax. So let me show you a little bit the documentation and we can go over it. One thing is that a lot of those things, this documentation, this is documented not only what is existing, is some part is existing and some is like, is the guideline for the implementation of language. So many of those features are not existing still, <laughs> but it's like guiding what we are trying to implement. Um, so let me go over one of the things that we built everything. For us, everything is a tuple. So what is a tuple? So the variables are tuples. Even when you declare a normal variable, a tuple is a tuple of size one. So a tuple is anything that starts with parentheses, and it can be name or a name, but it has to be order. So it means that this is position zero, this is position one. And maybe there are names or names, but it's but it has to be ordered. Um, so you can access by dot zero, or you can access by name if it exists. And this is just different ways to access the access the same thing. Now, when you it means that because everything is a tuple, if you return a variable, well, if I just return a tuple, which is like a struct but it can have a name field. Um, so that's one thing with all the variables. The other thing that is interesting is that we treat everything as a signed integer with unlimited 
Perfect. So what are the basic types? Um, so this is just for tuples. Just keep going over this. Well, let's go over the document more or less in order. Um, there is the bar that it allows you to mutate the object. There is let who doesn't allow you to mutate the object. So it, typical thing in current modern language that you will expect. Um, there is the plus plus is to concatenate and the dot dot is to in place insert. Like for example, this is a join. If I have A and B, so it will be a same type of concatenating both. If the fields were replicated, it will give a compile error. It's the same name appears in A and B. If the, so like in this case, because I'm putting B again, so it's a compile error. If I do the plus plus, it will overwrite using whatever is the last one. But th those are tuple operations. Um, now, one thing is like, okay, what's the difference between a tuple and an array? So an array is a tuple where all the fields have the same type. So in a tuple, the first might be a Boolean, the second an integer with a maximum of 33, but they can have different fields. Array is a tuple with everything is the same type. So they, we use the same syntax and everything. So we try to be very clean on the syntax. Uh, let me skip the enumerates because I don't think it matters so much. So the types that we have. Um, so one thing is like, whenever you declare, you can use a variable. This, what it says is check that the type is integer. Now if I do it on the declaration, we're gonna see that later, it will abide the type to the variable. But you can write expressions. Well, this is, well, let's go over the basic types. What are the basic types? We have a Boolean, we have an enumerate, we have a function, a procedure, which I already mentioned. The integer, which is sign, but you can always bound what's the maximum and minimum value. So it's not that we say the, type, the number of bits. It's like you say this is integer. If I don't say anything, it's minus infinite plus infinite. But you can say it goes from 3 to 26, or it goes from minus 8 to 7, and then it's 3 bits, sign. Or you can say from 0 to 7. So you can bound max min, and that's inside the compiler propagating all over. Um, then we have ranges that they are used for loop iterators, but also to do one hot encoding, because there's a way to translate the range to a binary encoding. So you do a range, for example, from 1 to 3 is it's this value binary, you do a typecast to an integer. Strings and variants, which is uh, it's like a union without a typecast. So the thing I was mentioning, the integer, so when we declare a variable, you can declare, assign a type, or it will infer it, uh, and you can assign a range. Um, we have three bit value, zero, one, and question mark. Uh, the question mark is because we try to be able to read any Verilog that is synthesizable. Uh, and also to generate, to be compatible. Now, the, in many places when we do simulation, we want to trigger errors with the question mark. But some, we want to support question mark. That's a difference with Chisel, for example, who doesn't have it. Um, Boolean, we can understand what's a Boolean. No need to go over it. Uh, the lambda is the branch of, of procedural. And the ranges, it's normal range. The only thing we are a little bit more explicit if the last one is included or is excluded on the syntax. And then the other one that is also quite useful that even exists in Verilog is what you do with a plus, which is starting with this offset up to that increment. Um, if you want to pick bits, 
you can use ranges. So this is to pick the bit from one to the last one. Uh, if you start with a negative number, it means starting from the end, like what Ruby does. That's the same thing as Ruby does. So this will be from the first up to excluding the last two bits. And you can convert uh, from binary to range or from range to binary, but it has to be explicit typecast. So these are more or less the basic types. So the strings. Now, how do you declare the types? Well, everything's a bundle. Uh, you can specify the, the types if you want. Uh, in a way, that's to declare a type system. It's I'm declaring what's the type that I'm going to be using later. Um, and you can check if it's the same type, if it's a structure, or if it's the same name. Yes? What's the difference between let and var? So in let means I declare a variable mm -hmm. and assign a, a value. I cannot change it. Okay. A var is mutable. It's like okay. a normal variable in C. Yes? Can integers have uh, variable bounds? What do you mean by variable bounds? So can I uh, define the upper and lower bound for the integer uh, by like some sort of parameter? You can do by parameter, but it has to be known at compile time. So it cannot be a runtime parameter. So one of the things that it's, for example, the tuples, you can also have parameters to add and remove fields, but they have to be compiled time. So compile time ranges have to be known. Types have to be known at compile time. One thing that is a little bit different is the attributes. And the reason why we have to put this thing is because you play with a, with a lot of things on the compiler and the synthesis, and it's a way to provide the feedback. And, and I think that it helps a little bit with uh, in a way, an attribute is a way from the programmer to pass directives to the compiler. And it can go back and forth. It's a way to provide hints to the compiler or read information from the compiler. So you can build your own passes, and that's what we are saying here. So like here, I declare a variable, and I assign max 300, or I'm reading that the attribute ATTR is 10. Assign it 10. So you can do accesses in several ways. But for example, one attribute that we use quite a bit is compile time, is comp time. So what do we mean here is, well, this variable is declared, it comes from XX from some other place, but the compiler will check, because that's the, you are talking to the compiler, check that this value of par is known at compile time. So if it's not compile time, it's a compile error. Let's assume that here this input comes from the, the method. But then when it's called, it's three. That's compile time. But if it comes from a memory that there's no way to guarantee, then it will be a compile error. So it's like comes in fresh in the same. It's more like a const EXPR, because a const will not guarantee it can come from yeah. runtime more like a const XPR, which I, yeah. Um, and you can ch uh, check, or you can check that the variable is compile time, and then make decisions based on that. So this is just an example, compile time. But you can also access the number of bits. As I mentioned before, you have the max and the min. The bits are going to be inferred by the flow. You don't specify the bits. If you say, oh, this variable has five bits, in fact, what you're saying, that's the maximum and that's the minimum. But I'm saying maximum and minimum. The tool can prove that it's less, and then it will return you less bits. It doesn't guarantee that it will have all those bits in the size. It will, that's, you are saying it should not pass those ranges, but you can do less and not have effects. That's legal. Uh, so this will read how many bits it's able to figure out. Um, so you can have several types, and we have a table here with types that gives you an idea. Um, but for example, one that is, you could build a pass to say, oh, I'm going to poison this, the variable, 
And then later, after you get propagated and assigned, you see that the type is still preserved. So you can build compiler passes to, to do checks. But the table that I have on the attributes, so what are the things that we have? So you can specify what's the name of your clock. The clock by default is implicit. So you don't have to say what. But if you have a register, you say dot clock equals foo. Well, foo, now it's my clock signal. And it will get propagated through. Uh, critical is something that we want to put so that you are telling to the tool, this should be on the critical path on timing. If it is not, give me a compile error. Because I want to, I'm assuming that this is my critical path. If it's not, uh, what happened to my synthesis? Uh, debug is that it's something that is quite common, at least you find OK. Is that you write code, and then you want to put some code for debugging, but you don't want to be synthesized. You don't want to be there on the synthesis. So whenever you mark debug, it's code that it can read synthesis code but it cannot affect synthesis code. And it will get simplified away. It will run during simulation, but not during synthesis. So you can write code in between to write checks in built in with your code, but it will get moved away. This is something that, for example, in, in Boom, which is that she's a lot of order core, there's a lot of signals that are underscore the back. And then the idea is that, depending on the options, they get removed, and you have to grab from the very log saying that they are all gone. Well, instead of doing all those manual things and checks and everything, it's built it with a compiler. This is to parse directive, like the synthesis delay time and things like that. So many of the attributes are, what is one of the problems that we do current languages, even very log. So you have the very log. You run simulation, and then you go to the synthesis. On the synthesis flow, there are many directives that change the behavior of the variable. So you can put false paths. You can put many things that now suddenly your simulations are not correct. And in fact, there is it's a very common to have bugs on tape out because of that. Now, what is conceptually the problem? It's like if you were programming in C, and if I change my compile options, my program behaves differently. Uh, you do O1 or O2, you expect the same result. And if there's some flag to enable something different, well, you will expect the same as my simulation. So what we are doing is that to avoid the tickle scripts and everything, you have to build it with the language. So you have to put the directives that you want to put on the line and timing on the language. Now, because the attribute can come from a function, maybe you have a function who instantiates what's going to be the delays. So there's some way to abstract it because maybe you target a PGA and ASIC, but you have to put it with the language because it can affect semantics. Otherwise, the behavior will be different. Um, and there are things like don't touch, which is like, a, I think, keep, or something like that in Chisel. Um, and there are several directives, like some of those are more for placement hints. And that's the list that we think we need. There are a few for registers. Uh, there are a few for pipelining. And then memory attributes. Do I, do, do I have an enabled signal? Do I have the clock? What's my size, the bit? A bunch of attributes. And this is the table that has all the attributes that we think we need. So we are sort of keeping them. Now. There is one thing that we are putting on the attributes, and it's something we have been going back and forth many times, is that is the bit width. So as I mentioned before, we have the max and the min. So obviously, there's an attribute for max and min. There's some syntax sugar, the u bits, the bits, which is for max and min, in a way, too. But it's with a more normal way to do it. But there is also the, the wrap and the saturate. So what is this wrap and this saturate? Whenever we do assigning, we always check that you don't drop any bit. If you are going to drop any bit, you have to explicitly say. In the original part, we were doing that with the comma. When we were writing the comma, which means the left-hand side of the assignment might drop bits. 
Now what we are sort of adding it into the attributes just you know, to have a new syntax. So what we are saying is wrap means drop kids. Saturate means that if the value here is bigger than the 36, it's the maximum value here on C. Uh, so, but if, if I didn't have any of those and the right hand side was bigger, it would be a compile error. And here there is some other examples. Now you have the compile attributes that have the debug attributes we already mentioned. So there are these things that attributes happens in many places. Um, now what's a register? So you read bar, that's the difference. Bar is pure combinational, it's gotta be a wire. Read, it means I have a flip-flop here. Now the value that I have on the right of the flip-flop is the reset value. So at the beginning we were having a reset code block separate. Now we just, you declare a read, the right hand side is the reset value. Well, this one is what is going to be set every cycle. There is a public private, and then the normal operators. Um, so in the statements, we try to be simple, not to have many things, but there is a one thing that we got from Verilog 2. So the unique means one of those, uh, only one of those conditions will be true at runtime, and it will be checked. So that's something that exists in Verilog. So in this case, it's obvious because con1 cannot be con2. But if I have a Boolean expression there, if I write an if, there's an implicit order. First, I check the first. If it's true, then I go to the second. Unique means only one of them is going to be true. So I can encode as a one hot. I can do a more efficient implementation. Um, there is the match statement which is a unique parallel. It's a unique full case check. So what does it mean? Only one of them can be true. And if I have this, a value of four will be a compile error. Or if I, uh, or simulation error if I cannot prove it. So it's a full parallel case with a unique. It's, you keep on you have the else in a way. One thing that we kept from, from Ruby, because and slightly different syntax, but it's the same that in Ruby. In Ruby, you can write the statement and the write that it blocks the less statement. You can say unless or if on the right side. So what does it mean? This, this is statement evaluates when or for, never. Uh, this is statement evaluates when this condition. So if A is Three or A is three is not evaluated. Suppose to have the nesting of the if that is very common for simple statements, and because we were used to the Ruby, it's, uh, it's a syntax sugar, but it's one thing that you have around there. You cannot apply to complicated statements because otherwise you don't know what's going on. Uh, your code blocks, like what you will explain in any programming language. Ep because in this class you are doing out of Chiso, everything is equivalent of blocking assignments. In Chiso, in a way, everything is equivalent of uh, non-blocking assignments. Um, if I write a value here, I can read it here and this value that I have. It's not that it's, I have connected and comes from the next one. It's a little closer to what you will expect. Um, you can have a code block and then with a return value. Um, some language allows you to do this. So what is this thing is I have this code block will evaluate x equals three. It's useless because no one is using it. If I have divided by x, that's legal. And then this is the return value. The last statement there is no need to put a return. So what is returning is uh, there is a eleven, eleven plus one. So
There is four loops, but four have to be the bounds have to be known at compile time. But it's useful to unroll things and code. They come with a value and index. So you put uh, one element is the value, you put two is the value of the index, and you put three is the key because it can be a tuple what you have index. You cannot modify the contents. You want to modify, you have to put a ref, which is here. So if I have this and I want to modify the, value, the contents of B, well, if I were doing this, it will not be modifying the contents of B. I have to do ref, which means I'm getting the reference. Something that is not in other languages, but we try, and that's something that maybe will disappear, but I was so attached to those things that I'm trying not to. Um, so in the language, as I mentioned, we have been evolving. No? One thing that we are careful is try to make the language syntax so that you don't need to know much about the language and it will trigger a compile error. Um, and what is the, this is one way it shows. So there is return and there is ret. So what is return? Return means I terminate my function, but uh, whatever, what's the value on the output? Well, when I declare the function, what is the problem? Do I have an example here? I don't have a function here. Uh, okay. Yeah, let me put the uh, lambda. So I have this function. So what is this thing? The res is the result. So if I write to res, I have I'm updating the result. So if after this I do return. What is the value on the output? It's called A plus B, because it's the last thing I wrote. But I'm not modifying the contents. But if I want to modify the contents, if I want to return a value, I have to do red, maybe three. And then you will write the value. It return three. And so return has no value. BRK and, and break is the equivalent that it would not have value. Um, One thing, and this is a little bit hardware specific, and, and some language has a little bit similar thing, and that's why we use the word defer. So what is a little hardware specific problem? So usually when you write a program, let's think of a C program, and let's ignore this paper. So what do I do? I call this function, I pass this argument, I connect the result, and I, let's assume that this is a ring. But it's a ring. If I'm trying to build a ring in hardware, what do I do? Well, the last one should connect to the first. But in what is the thing? I have already assigned it here, I still don't see it. So how do I do that? Um, in some language, there is a statement that is called defer. And what that means is that this is a statement is executed at the end of the current code block. So we use the same defer name, but as an attribute. So what this means is give me the last value that it was written to at home. Compiler can wire it in that way. So it gives me the last value written to that code. And then it allows you to connect things. You have things like a loop or things like that. Uh, in hardware, depending on the language, you have the non blocking and then avoid that problem with the non blocking because they are not signing. You can just read it later. But you have blocking, that is what more programming language will expect to have this issue. Um, that already works on the compiler and it's very easy to implement on the compiler. So you can defer the reads or you can defer the writes. Sorry. Yes? So here, but F4 needs to be declared though before the statement, right? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, so you have to do a bar F4 first. The other thing that we have been doing from nearly the very beginning is if you have a register, 
So you put, you say counter, it will access the register directly. Uh, you can put counter defer, which means the end of the cycle. But you can put a pound. Whenever we do pound, it means cycle timing related. So we put that in all the syntax. We do pound bigger than, it's called pipelining. Equal pound is because the right hand side might have different timing. So whenever it's a pound, is careful time. So what is the thing? You can put a variable and say pound minus one. So it means give me the value of the flop from last cycle which technically is done in the compiler world. Now you don't have one counter, you have two. I'm gonna flop it, and the next is gonna flop to the next. So it, it forces to have two flops. Uh, if you do zero, you will say, oh, that's the same. Well, in this case, it's the same. But really, what it means, it gets the key pin of this one. So if I have been doing some update here, and I put the zero, I'm still accessing the key pin. So I don't access the whatever has been the next modification. If I put one in the compiler, so it's a kind of go to the future. Unless it's for debug, because you can do that for writing assertions. So it's like when you write assertions, it's okay, but if it's not an assert, a debug statement, it's gonna be okay. Um, and when you do, for example, the defer, the defer value will be um, the frequency after the, for this statement. Um, so that's the first. We have a code block for test that any languages have it. And you can embed it with the code and then it will run. Uh, but I mentioned before, so if I put the for loop, um, then I have parallel test. If I do it in this way, it's a single test. In theory, if I have a multicore, I can run all the other in parallel, or this one will be a single test. Um, there are a couple of statements that there are for test only. So we try to be very careful, every synthesizable, but there's these two statements that you can write on inside the test and they are not synthesizable. Uh, what is one is that you can do a step with a bunch of number of cycles that you want or wait for, which is a for loop waiting for a condition. So we have the lambdas, and there's the instantiation. Let me go to the beginning, and, and it's something that is um, a little bit tricky, and it's very different across all the programming languages. Um, so when you are building a programming language, usually it's for a new machine, you have a PC, and it keeps evolving and increasing. When you are building a hardware, you don't have that but you want to make believe the programmer that it does that, because then it's closer to what the hard the person programming does. Otherwise, you come up with a language like Verilog, and you start to do connections, data flow, weird things. What is one of the things that is a key difference? Is this instantiation versus execution? And this is what it really is one of the key difference. When you are programming in Chisel and Verilog, you are thinking, oh, I'm gonna instantiate this block. And I'm gonna instantiate this block and those are my connections. And then I'm gonna connect this block with this one. But you're programming in C, you are not thinking in that way. You are thinking I'm running my sequence of code and that's gonna map to, I don't know what, assembly, you want to think, but you don't even need to think about that. So your way of thinking is different. And a very good related example, let me see if I, for whatever reason, my connection died, so, so can I go to my side project, live regression, where do I have it? Uh, Now 
have it over here. Oh, I forgot where I put it. Is it here? No. Oh. Okay, so here I was having the path, which is. So if I have this chisel chunk, so what do I have? I have this module, which is, well, I cannot highlight, but anyway. So I have the module at the bottom, which is just What I'm gonna have, I have a when, which is an if, and then I instantiate two possible sub-modules. So that's really a chisel. Now, it will not, if I'm seen as a C programmer, in the very of it is not big. But if I think as a C programmer, what does that mean? I mean, well, I have this runtime option, and then I will execute this, and I'll put it on the output, or otherwise I'll execute this, I'll put it on the output. But because I'm doing CISO, in CISO I'm thinking of most SQL, I think I'll instantiation. So what does it mean? It's like, well, if I have this option, I'll instantiate this. Oh, but but that's not going to be this, so it's the same putting it here or putting it outside. There is no difference. So it means I will instantiate always. And this I will instantiate always. And then there is the, the output. Now if we look at the very log for this, that's what it does. It was module.p. So it instantiates the module twice. And then there is the if only for the output. If the values were not matching and things like that, I don't think you can do it. If you don't cover in if the if and the else, I don't think it works because it leaves it disconnected and it does strange things. Um, that's not what you will expect. And what is the thing we are trying to do? The semantics that we are trying to follow is that you have an entry point that is the main. When you program a C program, the idea is that you get a main and execute until it reaches the exit. Usually, maybe it returns to the end and then you exit. Our semantics is that's the same for us, but it's every cycle. So we try to respect that semantic that you will expect in a programmer, but that's what's going to be happening every cycle. Every cycle, we call the program and updates on the hardware description language. So it goes through every path, and you are specifying what's happening on that cycle. If you have a reg, it means preserves the value across cycles. So what happens if I have an if? Like in the previous case, a different syntax, but similar idea, no? So let's imagine that this is fire syntax. Um, so if I have an if, well, it means that I will go through this side, and I execute either this or that. I will not instantiate both. If I can prove that they are multiple exclusive, I will instantiate, in this case, it's uh, the same module, so I will instantiate only one. If I cannot prove, then I will instantiate both. But I will pass a valid signal 
to the to the input say is valid or not valid. So the question mark that we were having for the last week, it will propagate. So imagine that they're a kind of proof that they're separate. So I'll have to instantiate both. But whenever I call it, I will pass the question mark signal. Now, if no one uses inside, that's okay. It will be the same. But why is that thing useful? Because imagine that inside this model you have a put, like printing on the screen. What's going to happen? It's going to be printing every cycle twice. And that's what it will do in TSO. Every cycle, it will be printed because they're instantiated, even if this is true or not true. If you are a normal programming technology, you will expect. You will expect, oh, I call one, so I call the other. So the put uses a valid signal. So things like that is what we are trying to do a little bit different. But our semantics is from the top module, you start to execute everything, every cycle, wherever it's been called. If there is a reg, it preserves a cross function calls from the top. There is also, that's for the top module, but every file, I don't, well, let me, let's go with the example because I, I think I have it set up since we are covering that thing. Um, where do I have this? Let's search for it. Setup. Okay, setup, reserved versus execution. So this is the section that I try to explain this thing. So there are maybe three types of code that you, when you are writing. There is the setup, that if you are writing Verilog is the initial. You writing Chisel is the Scala code. The Scala is whatever skeleton you are building and you are building your functions or whatever, but it's not gonna be executed at runtime. In Verilog is the initial state. You initialize things, but they sort of a little magic to set up things. There is not a lot of setup in Verilog, but initial code. There is reset, that is the code that is for reset, and there's the execution, but it's executed every cycle. So every, so you, if this is your m module, so what is gonna be? Whatever you assign to registers, it's gonna be code that is only for reset. So instead of this, I could have a function. So that, that function will be for the reset. Notice that here I don't have any function. So if I don't have any function, really, this is run once as a setup, and it will leave the instantiation. If I have a function like this, then later I can call well, this is the reset code anyway. So that's an example of reset. Let me look uh, here. So I have, uh, no, this is not an example of function. Okay, execution code. So, so you have this uh, very log, so to understand the difference. And there are three different ways to write part of. So one option is I declare my function that is the inner and the top. Notice that those are functions. Those are not run during setup. So in a way, they are run during setup, but there's nothing to do. The setup is what runs before, and they play the function, runs after they play the function, that's it. Nothing is not creation. But really, I could have put a put here, print on the screen, and it would have run only once in the first cycle that is the setup, or before reset and everything. Um, another, but there are many ways that you can build that you can have structs or not. But the code that you have outside is set up. They, you declare a top function, and then that can start to call other functions, and that's the execute. So one is the main, and then it starts to propagate everywhere. Uh, or you can have code that there, in the right side of an assignment with reg, then it's reset. Now, it allows you to build this style that is very very lock like oops. It's like you have the two modules, one instantiating the other. Or you can start to build objects if you want. So whenever 
Uh, setter, it means whenever I assign to this variable, call this method. Uh, and this is the top, so whenever I assign the variable, call this method. So here I declare a top and assign a, b, so it's, um, so what is this? I'm declaring this type. So it's, I'm declaring a struct, in a way. Notice that it's not um, a, fun a function. I'm declaring a struct. Now whenever I do the assignment, it will call this method. Uh, which that's why I'm doing here. I'm declaring the struct that is the top here, and I'm passing the connection. Uh, and then I declare self because it's a struct, so the self is for fields on the by itself, and then I can connect the values. Or the other one, which I forgot what I was doing here, is a little variation of the same thing. So there's the three types of code, but the way we're trying to do it is the execute part that is the thing that is different from what you would expect. It's execute every cycle. And, and if there is if and else, it propagates valid, which we think is going to be, we still don't have implemented that part of the way, but we think it was going to be useful for clock gated. So in fact, you want to put the things inside the if and the else because if you can prove that it's not used and that it fails, then it will propagate the information for the clock gating and it should save energy. So yeah? the first part of the example, what determines that top to the main function? Ah, when you call it, you specify what's the top. Oh, okay. When you call the compiler. Yeah, there is no clear what's the top. You specify my test or my synthesis, what's my top. We could have a main, <laughs> that is, you define the variable main is the same, but if you start to use different modules, it can create a conflict. I think it's better not to. Uh, well, that's an example for registers. Um, one thing that we allow is to instantiate, so I, I have it directly, instantiate directly the cells in the library in case that you want to go low level. Uh, to, so you say, okay, instantiate the max. In theory, it should be the same, but you can go and instantiate the low level you want. So uh, maybe the, one of the last things, uh, what time is the class finish? Okay, so one of the last things we're not defined. Um, there is quite a bit of support for pipelining. So for example, this, I think it's quite obvious what it does. So it's, this is the first cycle. If I put this, it means this is pipeline second cycle. And, and here I can say uh, the number of cycles. A little example that I have. Where do I have the LU example? No. Okay, so this one. So you could pipeline just by directly using the flops and the instance. Um, where is it? You can do explicitly saying what are the pipeline stages, or you can say, well, I'm doing the multiplication, then three cycles later, I'm doing the addition. So it's pipelining that for you. So the, what the code looks like is something like this. And the, the value is propagated. So you can specify, start to insert the flops here. Um, and then on the assignment, you can check. That is the number of cycles that you were expecting. Um, yeah, you can do explicitly, or you can do try to use the flow to, to help you. And this is a little example. So I think that's the time for the end of the class. So this is what we are working. Uh, stop recording.